Hello, my name is Tommy Simmons, and just about four years ago, we had a very interesting event, conversation, with Eugene Reevy and Alan McBride in Ancoon, here in Ross Trevor. Uh, the event was called A Higher Quality of Disagreement, and it was organized by Arts of Wonder. Both men had suffered much. Alan McBride from Belfast. He had lost his wife and his father-in-law, Desmond, his wife, Sharon, and father-in-law, Desmond, in the Shankill bomb. Eugene Reevy, his three brothers were murdered in their own home. And there was retaliation, terrible retaliation after that, which killed 10 Protestant workmen. But to make matters even worse for Eugene, he was accused in the British Parliament of having been in some way involved in that retaliation. Just last week, 45 years after those terrible events, it was agreed and declared in the British Parliament that Eugene Reevy was totally innocent of such a terrible crime. He wasn't able to go and celebrate in Westminster last week because he had developed COVID, the COVID virus. But tonight on the program here on the music of what happens, TV, Eugene and Alan will be joining us online to remember those terrible times and to look forward with hope into the future. Well, in good times and bad times and in sad times and hard times, uh, there are two people in particular that I love to meet up with. And uh, there's always a, a smile despite all things and uh, a hopeful outlook. That's Eugene Ravy and Alan McBride. And uh, Eugene just having a, a cup of tea there, I hope, Eugene. Coffee, Tommy, coffee. Ooh, coffee. <laughs> coffee. Yes. Well, I just wanted to, we're going to play a little piece that we did together in Restrever. It must be, well, it's maybe two or three years ago. And uh, people were very, very moved by it. And uh, I just want to look at it again because, uh, well, Alan, you've been doing wonderful things with your organization, uh, Wave Trauma, yeah, really. and uh, Eugene with TARP. And uh, Eugene, you, you had uh, you had the COVID, the COVID there, didn't you? I had, yeah. Must have been. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, on the, I got tested on the Friday, on the 1st of October, I think it was, on the... Uh, I got the word at 11.59 a.m. on the Saturday morning that I'd tested positive. Oh and it was such a shock to me because I didn't feel anything, you know. Mm -hmm. A week earlier, I had got the flu vaccine and I sort of felt a wee bit, you know, queasy afterwards. And I thought that was all what it was. But uh, it was very bad, Tommy. And I think it was yesterday was about the first day that I was actually out. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so uh, I haven't many miles on my Jeep as last while now. I'm you know, sure. well, it, it it must have been it must be great to be feeling better, Eugene. It, it, it takes a long time. Well, I uh, you know I'm not better yet now. Tell me it'll be it'll be Christmas or or thereabouts. I would say I have no energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can sleep 16, 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a craving on me for sleep. Yes, yes. You know, when I get up in the morning and get the like, cows fed and one thing and another, and I come back in, I'm just, there's only one thing on my mind is to get up the stairs into the bed. Well, that, that must have been a great gift for you, Eugene, uh, that news from Westminster. Uh, oh, yeah. In the week. Yeah. Well, uh, on, on, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to really enjoy it, you know, because I would love to have been over there when the thing was 
it was going on. I think we should, but, tell, we should, we should tell the, the, the viewers, Eugene, yes. uh, that, uh, of course, three brothers killed and there's a retaliation for it and you were blamed by a member of parliament in, in Westminster. And yes. hanging over your head and you totally innocent. I'd like to talk about that after a while, Eugene. All right. And uh, Alan, how about yourself? Uh, how, how are things? I, no, I, I, I've been good. Uh, I was sorry to hear about Eugene. Actually, I was on the phone with him yesterday. There, just uh, actually, I saw us having her from for a while. Now going with him twice in, in two days. Um, well, I was just going up to find out how he was. So I was very, very concerned to hear that he had the had the COVID. You know, um, mm. but no, I've been fine. Uh, a friend of mine had it, and I had to self isolate for a while. Uh, yes. But apart from that, I haven't, uh, I haven't had any. Any symptoms around like that, you know? So I've been, so I, I've just been finding it hard. Was like everybody just in terms of, you know, lockdown, nothing open. You can't go anywhere. You can't spend any money. You can't do this, that, the other thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, we're, no doubt we're getting it, we're getting it uh, late compared to what uh, what Eugene and others have been through, and particularly yeah. those that have actually lost people to, to this dreaded pandemic, you know. Um, yeah. I'm glad that uh, as we're approaching Christmas, at least we've got the the vaccine on the horizon, and hopefully in the new year. Uh, we'll be able to get people vaccinated and get back to a wee bit of normality. Yeah, it would be great. You know, I was thinking, uh, I was writing an old song there, you know, uh, come gather good friends, come gather anew, not like the way that we all used to do, with a hug or a handshake, a cuddle or two, but a Zoom and a Skype and a meter or two, between me and you, <laughs> between me and you. The future is resting between me and you. Is what I'm telling Don't 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 it down the Van Morrison Road of writing these uh, protest songs about the COVID. <laughs> I don't think so. So far, <laughs> Tommy, <laughs> you will never get the uh, COVID living where you are. This the breeze coming off that sea you wouldn't let it land at your house one minute. Well, Third uh, one. Well, I, I, I would, I would like that would be right, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and what about the, uh, how, how about the wave? Uh, I, we're, we're, we're still working away, Tommy, as hard as ever. In fact, our work actually, I would say, is actually uh, doubled almost because a lot of people are uh, not able to get in for services, and so they're being uh, seen remotely. You know, with uh, Zoom and Skype and the things that you were singing about there. Um, I mean, we're, 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 we've been doing remote uh, therapies and uh, remote one-to-one -one conversations. We've been doing a lot of uh, support for people who were uh, self-isolated in terms of providing essential shopping for them and stuff like that. Uh, and then in the midst of all this, of course, I mean, I've been very, very busy with the pension uh, for the very yeah. seriously disabled people. And you'll probably have heard if you've been following the news that uh, we got that over the line as of the 29th of May of this year, but that uh, Sinn Féin blocked it for two months. Uh, so uh, Jennifer McNairn, uh, who's a great friend of mine, uh, ended up taking the executive office to court and uh, she, she won, won that case. In fact, the judge actually described the executive office's defence as arrant nonsense. Uh, so, you know, we've got that now on statute. Uh, we're heading forward and we're hoping that the pension will be delivered uh, in, uh, in March of next year, which is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a delay. Uh, but we're hoping that at the end of the day, that people will be able to see something in their uh, in their in their their bank accounts. I mean, these are people, Tommy, that were horrifically maimed, yeah, and injured. I mean, double amputees, paraplegics, uh, blind, deaf, people with very profound mental health disorders. Uh, you know, so it's only but right that uh, I think that a care and society looks after these people, particularly as they approach old age. And I'm glad to say that you know we're now that that's now in legislation. And we're just waiting now for, uh, for, for people to put the money up and, and get it on, you know. That whole legacy issue is a very complicated one, isn't it? It is. It's very, very, it's very, very mm. difficult. And I don't see it being sorted like for a long, long time. Yeah. It's a pity like that, the, like that the people left behind have to resort to the legal route because nobody really wants to go to that route, Tommy. Like people are... Uh, People are affected enough by the by the trouble without all this extra burden now in our later years, like about having to go to court and try to make a like 
it just keeps bringing it bringing it all up to you every day yeah. that goes by. Yeah. How anybody up in Stormont could could uh, den- uh, deny those people money like that they should have had years ago? Like, like a lot of them uh, won't get time to uh, and uh, uh, enjoy it, Alan. Like they're. No, that's exactly right. I mean, Tommy, we've had, uh, since we started our campaign uh, 11 years ago, uh, we have lost six members of our group. Uh, they are. Just have died. And in the last, in the last uh, four months, certainly since COVID, we've lost two members of our group, uh, just uh, old age and, uh, and, yeah. and what have you. you know. So it is up to you know, the executive now just to, to deliver this thing. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very uh, at times disillusioned to be honest with you with, uh, uh, with politics here, and I mean even COVID, and I'm, I'm thinking back to you know Edwin Poots's comments about you know, which was actually funny in a way if it wasn't so serious, but when he suggested that you know uh, Catholics were were, were 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 spreading COVID more than Protestants, I mean <laughs> o- o- only only here could be sectarianize, uh, you know something like COVID. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I don't think the executive does have a a proven track record of actually of, of, of delivering stuff here. And so during the week, actually, I actually was getting quite disillusioned about whether this place was actually uh, governable at all. You know, in terms of all, all the all the things that have gone on around around the COVID. Um, but uh, yeah. we just have to keep going and and, and, and try our best to help. Well, exactly. That's what we want, Tommy. You're you're just trying to help ordinary people, regardless of whether they're Catholic or Protestant or Nationalist or Unionist or Republican or Loyalist. You just want to try and help people, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and looking back, sometimes it's difficult looking back, and we're going to be looking back a little bit now, actually. But I would like you to hold on, and we could have a chat afterwards because uh, I want you to bring me up to date on how things are going and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's just great to, to see you again, and you're looking just as Thanks, young as were three <laughs> years ago or whenever it was that we met. We're going back there right now. There were roses, roses, there were roses, and the tears of the people ran together. There were roses. Roses, there were roses. I'd like to introduce you to two people who uh, have come together in uh, in very sad circumstances, in a way. But uh, what they've done together, it's it's very very powerful. Please welcome Eugene Reevy and Alan McBride. <laughs> sure where to start. Uh, two people I admire very much. I've seen them in various parts uh, of Ireland, certainly, speaking about their experiences and uh, uh, what they have come through and their struggles for the future as well. Uh, Eugene, uh, maybe we start with you. Uh, your three brothers shot. Uh, I'm sure that's something that always stays with you. Yeah, Tommy. It was a very traumatic time. It was, uh, it was just after Christmas, nineteen seventy-six, and uh, decorations were still up in the house. And my mother and father and three, three or four of the younger ones had just gone over to Camelot for to visit mommy's sister. And uh, John Martin said he would leave them over and. Oliver said, no, he says, I'll go. Now, that time, it, it was a great thing to get out in the car and get away for a run, you know. But uh, unfortunately, shortly after I went away, our door was always open. It was like what somebody said there uh, early on, it was a Cayley house. And uh, the boys were watching Celebrity Squares on the television. And uh, it was it was a kitchen. It was a living room. It was where you bath. It was where you washed. It was where you cooked. There was no other room. So the next thing was this this the uh, door opened up, and the barrel of a gun came in. 
But our boys didn't really pass much remarks. It was the soldiers was at the door. And uh, the next thing was this man opened up and he put, he fired 43 bullets into one of my brothers, John Martin. He was, he was laying on the floor. He was like a rag doll. That's all you could excuse. And the other two boys then tried to run up into the bedroom and Brian, who was 22, Lord of Mercy, he was shot one, one shot through the back and through his heart. And Anthony, the youngest fella, he dived onto the bed and the, the gunmen followed him up into the room and they sprayed the bread with, with bullets. And, uh, and when they thought he was dead, then they went back up into the kitchen and they shut off all the other doors in the house looking for the rest of the family. So after about five minutes when the shooting had stopped and, and Anthony heard the cars going away, he crawled out from, from under the bed and he crawled from about here over to that chair oh. and, he, and he felt Brian dead in the, in the fireplace, there was no pulse. And he came on then up into the kitchen as we called it and John Martin was laying there and he, and he, he knew to look at him that he was dead. So he crawled out onto the road and was able to go up to the neighbour's house. It was a couple of hundred yards up the road and he crawled up on his hands and knees and he banged on the neighbour's door and, he, and when Mrs O'Hanlon opened the door he shouted into her, Angela, I'm shot and the boys are all shot. And then he he um, he conked out and Mrs O'Hanlon she, she uh, cradled him and she got a blanket on the floor and put a pillow under him and rang for the for the police and the soldiers. But uh, announced to all that there was a policeman arrived at the house be, be before the alarm was raised. So where he came out of, nobody knows. He told the historical inquiries team that he travelled with two other police officers. And when they were questioned, they said no, that he didn't travel with them, like there was only the, the two of them in the car. But anyway, I'm not going to go through uh, the whole thing. On the Monday afternoon, my father was interviewed on TV and he said that that he didn't want any retaliation for his boys. If their deaths would put a stop to the shootings, they wouldn't have died in vain. But then, as we know, his his words fell on, on a deaf ears and we left home at about a quarter to six on our way into Daisy Hill Hospital for the pick up the corpses. And a half mile over the road at Kings Mills, we ran into the Kings Mills massacre. And just as we approached the top of the hill, there was a there was a fella come running out and he was waving his arms and waving and he says, Stop using he says there's an awful carnage up here. So I got out of the car and walked up and I seen all these bodies lying on the road. And the, uh, the lights of the minibus were me, were me still on and the steam was, was arising out of those bodies on the road and the smell of death I, it never it never ever left me. Even to this day, sometimes I'd have, I'd have waken up and i have that smell of death. It's terrible altogether. But uh, poor Alan Black, he was lying at the side of the minibus and I didn't see him. And I, I always think to myself, I was very selfish for to leave that scene without looking a bit Alan. But the other fella didn't see him either and he was still living. So we got everybody... Uh, away and we got the cars all turned around and into Daisy Hill. How much time have I done? I would have too much ever. I want to come back to you again anyway yeah. because 
So, within the Daisy Hill, and there was ambulances flying everywhere, and police cars, and one thing and another, but uh, nobody knew who was shot, or who was killed, or who they were all, I mean, all we knew was that they were, that they were workers uh, coming home from their, from their day's work, and there was a room at the side at Daisy Hill, and after we had our prayers said, and the, and the, the coffin's ready to leave. We couldn't get leaving, so I went into this room and there was all these relatives, and I said, I'm Eugene Reavy, I'm a member of the Reavy family, and we would like to express our condolences to you on the death of your loved ones. And we still did not know who they were. So there's not a piece of that story now that I can't tell because it's too emotional and I'm not better to do it, Tommy, so... Well, Eugene, I mean, that, that picture you're painting, I can understand the pain and trauma that you went through. And uh, Alan, I, I know you, uh, are, I think, one of the founder members of the WAVE trauma group, and I'd like to talk about that in a minute, but uh, it's Shankel Baum, your wife. Yeah. Yeah, it was my, my wife and my father-in-law actually um, uh, died in that, that bomb. Uh, they had other people, including obviously the, one of the guys that, that carried the bomb into the shop. Uh, I mean, it was a Saturday, 23rd of October, 1993, a day that uh, you know is forever etched in my memory and something I'll never forget. I was actually out on my bike that day with my daughter. Uh, she was two years old and we had a little seat on the, the back of the bike. And I got into the house um, at around two in the afternoon and somebody, uh, a friend, um, actually a friend that went to Pastor Jim's church, uh, a guy called uh, Hugh McGrath, Dino, uh, called around the house. Uh, uh, he was a family friend and he, he said that he'd heard on the news that there was a, a bomb on the shankle. And I think one of the, the great tragedies of, of Northern Ireland and of what we lived through was the fact that we made the abnormal normal. Um, you know, so we kind of lived through the troubles and you just heard about explosions and bombings and killings and shootings and, you know, after a while, what shocked you initially just stopped shocking you. Um, so when I heard there was a bomb in the shankle, um, you know, I didn't think really anything of it. I thought, well, we'll go down and see what's what's going on. And I went down and got to the corner um, of, the, of Berlin Street. Uh, the shop was just around the corner. Uh, the whole place was just blew to bits. Uh, you know, my wife was killed, her dad, um, and as I say, eight other people. Incredible. Uh, get, getting back to yourself for a, for a moment, uh, Eugene. Remember, you tell me one time, uh, your mother, uh, she used to uh, light a candle for the for the people who, who shot your yeah. Um, that's right, Tommy. Uh, Mama used to, uh, every morning I used to go in to see her about maybe 10 o'clock, half 10, when I was going away somewhere, and, uh, and she'd have all these candles lit uh, at the fireplace. And, I, I, and I'd say, Granny, who in the name of God are you praying for the day? Oh, she says, listen here, listen here is going for a scan, and this girl here is doing her a level she says, and these two over here are three. She says, they're for the people that shot my sons. And she prayed for them every day of her life until the day she died. She never stopped. And she always said that she never blamed those fellas that pulled the, the triggers. It was the people that sent them out. And as we all know it was the Glenan gang that shot my brothers. And they were a mixture of police and UDR men. I suppose uh, you've told these stories a lot, but maybe we have to hear them again and again and again and again to, to uh, I suppose, modify what we say and what we do. The, the, uh, t tell me about the, the, the wave group that you, that you have. Okay, I, so uh, I didn't actually uh, start with, uh, I, I joined in about 1994, it actually started in 1991. Uh, so it's, a, it's an organisation which has been set up really to help and to provide care and support for people who were impacted by the Troubles. Uh, we're going now uh, 26 years this year. 
Uh, we provide a lot of help, a lot of support services for people that were affected were across community organisations, so we welcome into our organisation people who have been affected by all sides, IRA, UVF, UDA, INLA, uh, the British state and also uh, the Irish state where, where they were culpable um, in, in, in certain murders. Uh, it's not been easy, if I'm being honest with you. Um, it's much easier to uh, set up an organisation that just looks after your own, uh, because then you're not open to criticism. Uh, and we have been open to a lot of criticism because of of our stance uh, on, on on insisting that you know that, that we do provide support services right across uh, right across the board. But whilst we're open to criticism in some quarters, I also think in terms of as a model for going forward in Northern Ireland, I think it's 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 quite apt. Uh, you know, I do believe that um, that Northern Ireland themselves is on a journey. Uh, that journey started, I think, way before 1998. We had various initiatives and talks, and we talks, and we talks, and then we had the peace agreement in 1998. And you know, it's been pretty much stop start ever since. Uh, I was appalled when the assembly collapsed before Christmas um, because I thought that you know, government was stable. But um, I think what that showed us was that government really wasn't stable. Uh, I was quite concerned, if I'm being honest, that you know. Uh, <coughs> that when the electorate spoke, uh, they returned the, the two largest parties that are still in power, and I'm hoping that they can reach some kind of an agreement and, and, and provide a way forward for us all, but uh, I'm not, you know, whilst I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm not that optimistic, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we are in a better place to where we were. There's <coughs> absolutely no doubt about that, and anybody that says anything different is talking absolute nonsense. But I think if you know you ask yourself in this room, you know, are we where we ought to be? And I think the answer has to come back: no, no, we're not. Uh, when I voted yes in the Good Friday Agreement, it, it was with a very heavy heart, to be honest with you, because I was voting for an agreement which, in a sense, um, allowed the people that murdered my wife uh, to be back out in the streets, having served a relatively short period of time in jail. Uh, you know, and and that, I'll be honest with you, at the time I thought that was unjust. Uh, but when I thought about, you know, a continuum of injustices, uh, you know, the greatest injustice of all, surely, would have been to lock our province into another, you know, 35 or 40 years of conflict. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted my daughter to have a better future, a better, you know, a better upbringing than I had in relation to all of that. Um, so I, I voted yes, uh, because I wanted to see that, you know, that bright tomorrow. And, you know, all those years later, almost 20, 20 next year from the Good Friday Agreement. The fact that you know we haven't arrived at the sort of place that I wanted us to arrive at and that we're still there, uh, we're still struggling, we're still aiming for that, um, I just would have liked to have thought that we were a little bit further down the road. And I'm hoping that once we get the Assembly back up and running again, and, and, and we will, I absolutely believe that, because at the end of the day, dialogue and working together is the only way you can run a government's only way you can run a society. Uh, even those people at the moment who are, you know, opponents of the peace process, I have absolutely no doubt that in another 25 or 30 years, they themselves would be sitting around the table um, discussing the things that we're talking about today. So w why wait all that time? Why, why not just get it right and, and get it on now? But of course, of course, it has to be about uh, things like equality. Uh, you know, nobody can be second-class citizens any longer in this society. I was actually joking with Eugene in the way in here tonight because he said to me, you know, that you know, you're know, you now part of the minority community here. <laughs> and um, I, I, think, I think, brother, uh, actually, uh, you'll find that we've still won ahead. Um, but, um, but, you know, uh, in all seriousness, we really shouldn't be, be, be talking in those terms at all because uh, this is a very small place. We are like 1.7 million people. We need to just learn how to be able to share this piece of land together. It's not rocket science. <laughs> let, let, me, let me just finish with this. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. An incredible woman. And the very first uh, human right and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that everybody is created equal in dignity and rights, that we're endowed with reason and conscience and that we should act towards one another 
in a spirit of brotherhood. If it was written today, no doubt they would probably add sisterhood. But it was written in 1948. Don't think they were being sexist. But that, that, that one human right, if all of the human rights could be, you know, put into one human right, I think that would be it. Because that speaks about rights, but it also speaks about responsibilities. And I think in this country, what we've done for far too long is within our own tribe has demanded our rights, but we haven't really thought about what we need to be uh, to other people to be responsible. And uh, a world where people just demand their rights, uh, I think, is God was going to end up in conflict and brokenness. And I think what we need to do is to look at rights and responsibilities together. Thank you. Well, uh, Alan and I are part of a, of a reconciliation group. It's, it's called the Truth and Reconciliation Platform. We've been over to London. We did one in, in Mullaban. We did one in All Saints in Belfast. I took him to knock, and he done one there, but he still had out Protestant blood in him, and I can't, I can't get it out of him. But I'm, I'm taking him out on the 20th of March to Port Leash, and we're going to have a good day there. And it's a, it's a sellout already. And uh, uh, then we're going to do one later on in the Helix in Dublin. And we hope that, that uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu will chair that one. So Alan and I, even though we're, like, we're from different backgrounds, uh, we, uh, when I was in the building trade, I think Alan's father was taking money off me. <laughs> or somebody belonged to his father. It wasn't too, wasn't too far away every let Friday me, night. Let, let me, I, had let a, me, I had a shill out. Let me finish with this, this story. My, my mother passed away there about a year ago. And uh, Eugene very kindly came to the wake. And uh, when we were in the house eating sandwiches and stuff like this, uh, Eugene was talking about when he lived, when he worked in Rathcool, uh, that uh, th th his building firm that he had, uh, he was given money hand over fist to the UDA, uh, and my father was in the UDA. So <laughs> he says to me, he says he, he says he must have given over a million pound. Yeah, I think yeah. he says in this time, and I just trying to say to him, Eugene, what do you think's penalty sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, Alan, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Thanks very much, Tom. Well, there we had Alan McBride and Eugene Reavy uh, with uh, amazing stories and uh, the, the great uh, strength that you have to keep on going and uh, helping all the people with your organisations. And I would like to get you, your websites as well on the screen before we before we finish that people will know how to get in touch with you or support you in, in any way possible. Uh, so uh, that's a few years ago, and uh, a lot of things have happened since. And uh, Eugene, maybe just uh, tell us about uh, the, the the Westminster. How did that How did that happen? Uh, that they, the, the you're vindicated that you're totally yeah. Right. Well, uh, as you know, I lost my three brothers in 1976 on the fourth of January, and uh, on the following. Day, which was Monday the 5th of January uh, I was the lead car in about 30 cars going in to pick up the corpses of my brothers in Daisy Hill and just short of a mile from our house we ran into the Kings Mills massacre and uh, it was a, a novel sight you know, I'll never forget it so that was all right. Like, I mean, the years went by and we were very friendly with the people at Bestbrook. And uh, next thing was in 1999, the MP for North Antrim took it upon himself to get up in the House of Commons and name me, he said, a senior Republican. He says, help to organize and carry out the King's Mills Massacre. Uh, you know, Tommy, it was the biggest gunk ever I got in my life. Like for the for it even be as associated in the same sentence as King's Mills, that you would do something wrong like that. 
But anyway, uh, I was very, very deeply uh, hurt, and, and my wife and family uh, felt very insecure and very afraid, and uh, it was a, it was a very, very difficult time. But Rory McShane, my solicitor, and and the late Paddy O'Hanlon took me down for the meet. The then chief constable, uh, what was his name? Uh, it's gone. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But anyway, during that during that conversation, um, he told us. He said, "Eugene Reevy is not wanted by the RUC in connection with Kings Mills or any other outstanding matters." So I said to them, well, that's all right, Chief Constable, but there's about 20 TV camera crews outside your gate waiting, uh, waiting on me coming out. Because at that time there was trouble in Belfast all the time, Tommy, and these people were there from America and Australia and Canada and wherever. So I said to them, I want you to go out there and tell them. And he said that, like that, as far as he was concerned, this was not a police document. This was a document that had been doctored, an old UDR document that had been doctored to include new names. So anyway, uh, Ronnie Flanagan's solicitor, he was the chief constable, and Rory McShane, wrote out a, a, a joint statement and Mr. Flanagan, to refer to him, he went out and delivered it. And I thought that would be the end of that, like that there wouldn't be any more. But no, people weren't in the... They weren't ready for that time. Mm. Like, for, it was 23 years after the killings and... And there'd been nobody lifted or arrested. And next thing was like there was there was news of somebody being talked about, and they were they had their uh, the hopes doomed again because they they had thought that there was somebody after all this time. But anyway, I tried and tried and tried and uh, for to uh, take them to court but I was I was flummoxed nearly all the time because he was because he said these remarks under parliamentary privilege. So we decided to take him to the High Court and ask him if he would devolve the source of his information and we tried that and it cost us a lot of money and he and he uh, and he never even turned up uh, his barrister that day was Jim Allister. So <laughs> there wasn't many laughs, Tommy, I, I can tell you. So uh, since that then, I've been, I've been trying to get the record in the House of Commons, the Hansard uh, rewritten, and then I was told that it can't be rewritten written, whatever was said will be said, but you can always put an amendment to it. So we've been trying for years and years to get back in and get this done, but unfortunately, uh, the DUP had had a bit, uh, a bit of power for a, a long time and we could never get in. So it was very opportune this time that we get in on the back of the Pat Finucan inquiry like that they were asking for and uh, I have to say I'm very very thankful to to uh, to the column Eastwood and Pat McGinn and you know Pat he's from Camla he's a Labour MP up in Liverpool mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it was very good for the, uh, to hear them uh, in the house and uh, uh, also for the for the Northern Ireland Minister to be there and for the reiterate 
um, what they were saying and for to say that Eugene Reevy is an innocent man and that is really all I wanted to hear. But as I said, it's a bit it's a bit of a bittersweet thing, Tommy. I couldn't get over for it. I would love to have been over mm-hmm. to hear it. It, 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 must, and, it must be a great relief, Eugene. And I suppose, I suppose, uh, Alan, you've been through so much yourself. Uh, the acknowledgement uh, of pain or of truth is very important, even though maybe it can't be changed. Just to acknowledge the pain or the hurt yeah. of someone else, regardless. Yeah, look, yeah, I mean, I had that experience in, in Edinburgh with a, a, a Republican and a Loyalist action. We were at for wee pub, and when I told my story, it was a Republican I actually apologized uh, for the shankle bomb. Uh, of course, the shankle bomb was where I, I lost my, my wife and my father in law. And, uh, you know, whilst it wasn't the entire Republican movement saying sorry. Uh, you know, it, it came from this guy, and for me at the time, I think it was it was very significant, certainly in my own healing process. But you know, I I can't begin to imagine, Tommy, what it would feel like uh, to be accused of the most heinous crime uh, that uh, that that Eugene was accused of, and I think it was quite cowardly, actually, of the uh, of 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 Paisley to uh, use parliamentary privilege to do this, but not to utter it. Uh, outside, uh, you know that that chamber because if he had done so, of course there's no doubt Eugene would have taken him to court and would have won a huge libel case. I would have thought, uh, and the fact that even uh, from then that, that that none of the Paisley family has has found the moral courage uh, to come in and to meet with Eugene and to write uh, this historic wrong, um, I think uh, you know is is really. Uh, regrettable and, in fact, actually morally reprehensible, to be quite honest with you. Um, so I've, uh, you know, Eugene's a great friend of mine. I've known him for years. And uh, if anybody just spent a, a day, uh, even a minute, with uh, with any of the Reeves, uh, you know, you would realize that there's not a sectarian bone in, in the man's body. I mean, he's just a, a great guy. And uh, the very thought that he could be associated with something as horrendous and heinous as King's Mills uh, is so far from the man that I that I know and love, you know, in terms of just just a great guy. So, uh, so I was glad that you know that 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 was uh, spoken about in Parliament just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think that that was that was a good thing. But um, I would I would still not even at this very late hour. Um, I mean, I'm a a unionist myself, and I would appeal to uh, to, to 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 Paisley, you know, to the Paisley family. Uh, Ian Jr. Uh, to, to to meet with Eugene and, and his family and to to apologise and to write that wrong, you know. But um, Is there something I guess some people have, have, have the courage to do that. And, and about politics, that people uh, are afraid to step out of their own uh, very seriously held beliefs. I mean, people like yourselves are uh, really leaders. Uh, in in the community, uh, you have suffered, yet, yet you, you don't hold uh, any. Uh, well, you're you're good friends, of course. You're you're good friends, uh, and there's not a sectarian bone in either of your bodies. Uh, people like that, people like you in politics, could uh, would it would seem could have an effect. Or do, do you ever consider that? Well, look, I, listen, I've, I've often dreamt about me and Eugene being First Minister and Deputy First Minister. I think we could <laughs> we could sort this place out in the morning. Well, I need to be First Minister. I you wouldn't know, I, I was, you, Eugene, Eugene, as, as you, you being the elder statesman, I would, I would like you to be First Minister. I would love to be your deputy. Um, you we could we get sort out, we get sort <laughs> out this no place, I'll tell you. I believe there's no difference between First Minister and Second Minister, isn't it? Isn't that no, no, there's right. not. No, there's, <laughs> no, there's not. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a joint office. I would love it to be called that. Actually, the office of the two first ministers. But yeah. listen, if it came to Eugene Ravy, I would gladly serve under Eugene as a staff. No problem. No problem well, at all. Well, Tommy, uh, Alan's a young man, and I have I have said to him several times, Alan, would you, for God's sake, you know, uh, get your your head sorted and get yourself sorted and get a few good people around you and go and stand because there never was a better time 
for an independent as now, I think. Like there was a long time an independent couldn't win. But by heavens, there's an opportunity now, I think. What do you think, Tommy? Well, I, I, I think uh, the whole politics can divide people because we want you in our box, don't go into their box. Whereas I know, I know. To recognize uh, everybody rather than just a majority or a minority or anything like that, that we're all part of this and all part of it together in a way. And I suppose the COVID thing or COVID uh, proves that so much that if, if, there's one, if there's one of us ill, uh, or there's something wrong with one of us, it, it, it will affect us all in some way or other. Yeah. Oh, can I say, to you, and actually, um, hopefully after Christmas, if I get the funding from, uh, from, a, from a funder I've applied for, I'm going to be working on a new book called The, the Brighter Side of the Troubles. Um, it's going to be a book about some of the positive stories that come out of the conflict. And I have had the privilege of actually working with people over going on 25 years now from all walks of life, all different shades of opinion, nationalists, Republican, loyalists, unionists. And I'll tell you, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, of human kindness that also happened uh, in the course of the Troubles, uh, as well as all the hard stuff. And uh, I just want to try to give um, a wee bit of focus, uh, particularly as Northern Ireland celebrates its 100th anniversary. And that's not to say, by the way, that, you know, that I mean, for some people that will be a good thing, for others that will not be a good thing. Uh, but I think in the year that's in it, uh, it'd be good just to hear some of these positive stories that um, that I think during the dark days actually were able to, to, to inspire us and, and keep us going. And uh, Eugene Reavy's going to be in that book. I'm going to be coming to him. And uh, also coming your way, Tommy, as well, because I know the Sands family have a lot of a lot of stories there from, from your travels. And, uh, you know, so that I'm hoping that that'll be out in the new year, you know. But j just getting back to politics, I believe that, you know, we need politicians in power that just want to make life better for people, yeah. irrespective of who you are or where you come from or, you know, what food you kick with or what church you go to. Uh, that's what politics should be about. It's about improving the lot for everybody. And, yeah. and, and sadly, uh, our politics here has been uh, divisive, uh, pretty much actually from the state was created. And uh, given that we're now in 2020, you'd have thought we'd have learned a lot of lessons and, you know, been able to stand together. And there has been times, I mean, when, when that has happened, I can remember uh, Martin McGuinness and Peter Robinson standing together whenever, um, uh, you know, the police officer was was murdered. And, you know, yeah. I think that was a great thing. Um, but those, those, uh, those, you know, images of people coming together uh, and taking those stands are, are few and far between nowadays. And, we probably, uh, we probably have to make it easier for the politicians as well, because sometimes we vote them in and, and they have the expectation that they, their followers are demanding certain things. But, the but they, they make it hard for themselves, Tommy. You know, I think that's, that's, the, that's the, the thing I would have. I mean, I, listen, I, I, I don't envy their task at this moment in time with COVID, trying to you know, keep the economy going at the same time as keeping people safe. I mean, that must be an, almost an impossible job to do. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I don't envy what, what they do, but I don't think that they make it easy for themselves, you know? I mean, I think that uh, some of them, uh, I mean, and that's, that's, I mean, look at Edwin Poots and his comments just of a, of, of a few weeks ago, and absolutely stupid, ridiculously, I mean, how can that man even be in politics thinking the things he thinks, do you know what I mean? And, and no doubt, you know, we've had others as well, uh, on on the Sinn Féin side and what they did over the Bobby Story funeral and all that, they, they don't they don't make it easy for themselves. And I think you know that they just need to stand back a wee bit and um and, and maybe just show a wee bit of leadership. And I think that would maybe at this time and where we are would wouldn't go amiss, you know. Well, Alan, what uh, the tank time I... book of yours and, and uh, Eugene, you're writing a book too. And, and, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, well, I haven't been at it now as two months, but I have to get I have to get back to it and get it out because it's important that I do, Tommy. And I always said it was important that the truth gets out there, you know, because mm -hmm. there's like there's been enough misinformation and finger pointing all my life, you know. So it's time I was out there. But I was just going to say, like that this time in the assembly, a few of the smaller parties have have put people up on their, their like the, they're, uh, they're working very, very well, I think, and uh, like they're better, fresher sometimes in, rather than the two big parties trying to 
deal with every, you know, I give you this and you give me that. And just for them, somebody that like that's not interested in any self betterment or you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think with uh, contributions from people like yourselves to society, it, it has to get better all the time. I look forward, whenever these books come out, that we get together again. And, and, and well, I hope to meet you before that, of course. Yeah. But, uh, thank you very much indeed, Alan and no Eugene. Always great Thank to you, Tommy. Thanks. Thanks for having us on, Tommy. No Eugene, problem. I'll speak to you soon, brother, all right? Right, okay, Alan, thank you very much. And all thank right. you, Tommy. All the Cheers, best. Tommy. Thank you very much.